All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I think we got down about verse 22 last time. I'm going to start in verse 21 again. And this kind of pick up when we get to verse 22. If any man therefore purge himself of these, and he, in this passage he's talking to you now about the work of the ministry and the responsibility that Timothy had in the work of the ministry. And it said, if any man therefore purge himself of the, uh, uh, from these, he should be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And, you know, when he says, uh, purge himself of these, uh, verse 22, he says, flee, also youthful lust. Um, then he says, uh, but follow righteousness, uh, and that kind of thing. What he's talking about here, the fleeing, the pursuing, the purging, he's talking about having a, a self-cleansing in the life of a believer for the work of the ministry. He's, when he says in verse 21, purge himself of these, he should be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared to every good works. He's not talking about people getting saved. Here are some saved people. They're already believers. But he's talking about in the work of the ministry, there, is some, there are some qualifications in regard to the work of the ministry. Verse 15, he says, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. There's a usefulness issue. And, you know, one of the things you learn when you want to serve the Lord is that there are things that can be in your life that, that, that um, hinder your ministry, that hold you back, that, that make people not want to listen to you, or that, 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 that uh, divert your time and attention. And that when he says, if any man therefore purge himself, this is our responsibility. God's given us an identity and a position in Christ, given us a calling as members of the body of Christ to be down through the passage. He uses all these metaphors about, about being a, a farmer and an athlete and a soldier and a, and, and a student. And now he talks about being a vessel in the house. But we have a responsibility to, to make ourselves, make our, our activity and our walk and our, and our work match the, 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 the uh, identity God gives us in Christ. And so we bring, we, he's talking about bringing your life and your ministry in the line with who you are. If any man therefore purge himself, you notice down in verse number 26, that they may recover themselves. This is, a, this is in, in the work of the ministry, there is a necessity for the personal application of the truth of God's word to your life. It's not something that just automatically happens. When you trust Christ, he puts you into the body of Christ. Then he gives you an opportunity to serve him, but that comes as you make a faith application. It's called the obedience of faith, as you make a faith application of his word to the details of your life. And there's a, there's a, 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 a self-purging, a fleeing. The way you purge yourself, verse number 22, you flee also youthful lust. You follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And I said, I think we stopped there last week, and I made the point that that with them is telling you this is, this is the, we're, he's talking about not the believer's life just isolated out by himself, but he's talking about the believer in conjunction with the work of the ministry of other saints, working together with them. And we're going we're gonna to flee youthful lust. We're going to grow up. We're going to follow after righteousness and faith and charity, peace. And we're going to do it with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Now that issue of the pure heart, if you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I said this morning, people are always talking about, love to talk about, like to talk about, want to talk about unity. And unity in the spirit, and unity, and most of the time, what people are talking about when they talk about unity is say, let's let's let let's just put the thing, the doctrinal things that divide us aside, and let's just love each other, and let's just get along with each other. The Rodney King kind of philosophy, and that's you know that is not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the unity of the spirit. You got First Timothy. Look at hold hold there and look at Colossians chapter three. When the Bible talks about charity, charity is a, is a very special word in Paul's epistles, only used in Paul's epistles. Well, not, not only, but it's used primarily in Paul's epistles. And it's a, it's a word that, is, that describes relationships among believers. And 
it's a word that describes the source of the unity that everybody wants to have. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. He's talking to the saints in the local church. And he says, put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved. You're, you're the elect of God. You are the chosen vehicle that God has, has, has designed to operate through in the, body, in, in the dispensation of grace. You're the body of Christ. You're holy and you're beloved. You have this status as a believer. Put on bowels of mercy. Down in the inner soul of your, of your life, put on mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing. If any may have a quarrel, I've said to you how many times, Brother Lange used to say the hardest thing you ever do in the work of the, in, in, in a Christian life is get along with other saints in, in, in a local church. Submerge yourself down. Put on mercy, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, forgiving, because even saints will have quarrels with one another. And you're, you're, you, you, you work together, and any time you work together, just put your hands and work them together. You get a little friction going, and heat gets there. And that's just part of life. And it's, it's a context in which you then can grow. You know, if nobody ever offends you, you're not, you don't have the privilege of forgiving them. But if they offend you, then you can forgive them. So when someone offends you, the, 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 the believing thing to do is to say, wow, you hurt my feelings. Thank God that I now can do something I couldn't do before. I can forgive you. Now, most of the time when somebody hurts your feelings, what do you want to do? You know, smack them upside the head, you know. Maybe you'll forbear them. Maybe you won't smack them, but you want to. You see what verse 13 says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another? Can I tell you that forgiveness is the key to harmonious, happy personal relationships, whether it's in your home or in your church or wherever it is? A lot of people will be forbearing. I've watched it happen time and again. They'll forbear. They'll put up with somebody, but they won't forgive them. I'm not going to fight. I'll hold it back. But I'm going to hold a grudge. Forbearance without forgiveness, listen to me, forbearance without forgiveness produces bitterness. The only way to get rid of the bitterness is forgiveness. Now, sometimes you have to have the forbearance, you know, just not to smack them, so you can come to yourself <laughs> and recover yourself out of the snare of the devil, the snare of your flesh, and then practice forgiveness. Because forgiveness is a choice of faith. Where you send the offense to the cross. And you say, if God, that, that sin against me right there, that offense against me, if God said the cross paid for it as far as he's concerned, I'll agree with God about it. And I won't seek a revenge. But without that, you're just going to brood, you'll brood about it, and you think about it, and you brood about it, and you... Pretty soon it produces bitterness. And that root of bitterness, Esau had it. And you never get over it. It gets its roots down in you. And it's like a dandelion. You know, you can go out and pull a dandelion up. You can get a little dandelion digger and dig up a root that's six inches deep. And if you didn't get the other three inches, it'll come back. Well, that's what bitterness does. So you, you practice that. Now, that practicing of that, walking in the identity, walking in that wonderful total forgiveness and liberty and grace and mercy that God's given you. In you put that on. That's what God's given it to you. It's yours. It's your privilege. So practice it. Then he says, verse 14, above all these, put all that on. And then above them, as the cover for it all, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The thing that binds perfected saints together. 
is charity. It's the practical glue that holds the saints together in the work of the ministry. We don't stick together because we all believe the same thing, vote for the same people, make the same kind of money, live in the same neighborhood, look the same way. The thing that binds us together is charity. So it's important to understand where charity comes from. And when he says over there in Timothy about with them that call on, uh, on the name of the uh, charity, with them that call upon the name of the Lord, that issue of charity is important out of a pure heart. Now, that thing about pure heart, look back at 1 Timothy chapter 1, because here's where charity comes from. Charity is the ability to look at a thing and value, value it and esteem it the way God does. It's a mental attitude love that can value a thing, view a thing, think about a thing, value, esteem a thing, cherish a thing the way God has divine viewpoint about life. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. But as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't change the doctrine. Take the doctrine that I give you, Paul says, and teach it. And don't teach anything else. Because there were people that were teaching other things. Verse 7, it is people desiring to be teachers of the law. When you try to teach the law and the dispensation of grace, you don't understand what you're saying. You don't understand what you're affirming. You're, you don't understand what you're talking about. You're going to have foolish and unlearned questions. We'll see that in a minute in 2 Timothy 2. And worse than that, you're going to be doing things to people that you don't even realize you're doing it and you're destroying their life. You're twisting the scripture and resting it to their people's own destruction spiritually. So don't change the doctrine. Verse number four, neither give heed to fables. When you change the doctrine, you begin to start looking to experience. A fable is a story that has a moral to it. Most of Christianity, their body of traditions and scholarships are just fables. Somebody says, well, we started with 20 people and now we've got 5,000. So the Cubs put more than that into a stadium every time they show up. I mean, and they're losers. Well, not this year, but they've been losers every year until now. We're riding down the road the other day, listening to the car, and they lost two games in a row and only got three hits in the two games, and the guy says, oh, it's over. <laughs> Cup fans are just so, you know, got the mindset, oh, I've been a good run. It's over now. Um, Paul Koch was telling me this morning, they went to the Cubs game this week, and they sat in the Bartman seat. <coughs> and I asked him, said, did, they have, did they have it marked? He said, no. But when we sat down, the usher came and said, no, that's the Bartman seat. Don't be catching any balls that come out. <laughs> so you know who Bartman was? He, he's the guy back in, was it 80-something, that caught the ball, that cost him the playoff victory? Buck Bartman. Okay, I thought it was Bartman. Well, he said Bartman, so I don't know. I, I, don't, I, just know who, I just know who the poor guy was that became infamous. And, uh, you know, they, they, but they got to sit in his seat for the ball game this week they went to. And, you know, people get this attitude about a fable is, a, is an experience, a story about an experience, Listen, your faith is not designed to rest in experiences. <clears throat> you, if it's truth, if what you believe is true, it will confirm itself in your experiences. But it, you believe it and it's true because it's what God's Word says. Okay? So don't, don't change the doctrine. Don't pay heed to faith. People said, this is happening there, that's happening over, there, over here. Well... Great. Christian magazines, Christian books, that's all they're for. He said, don't pay any attention to that stuff. Neither paying attention to endless genealogies. That's making people the issue. Which minister questions? Now, we're going to see questions in a minute in Timothy. So where do the questions come from? They come from changing the doctrine 
focusing on human experiences and making people your, 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 issue, your, your guide. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, there is an edification system in, in, in your Bible, both for the prophetic program and for the mystery program, both for Israel's program and for the body of Christ. And there is a specifically designed edification structure for you and me in, the, in Paul's epistles. That's why Paul's epistles are laid out the way they're laid out. And that doctrine of proof correction, doctrine of proof correction issue is there. And that's what the local church need, is to be focused on, is bringing saints to perfection through the godly edif edifying you in, in the program that God has in effect today. Now verse 5 is where I'm trying to get to. The end of the commandment. What commandment? I charge some, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Don't change the doctrine. Don't pay attention to stories. Don't give homage to personalities. But give yourself to godly edifying. And the end, the result of following those instructions is what? It's charity. So where does charity come from? It comes from godly edifying. So if you give yourself to godly edifying, if you give yourself to perfecting the saints, it's the bond of perfectness. It's the bond, it's the glue that holds the saints together who are perfected. So if you follow the commandment, if you do what he says, if you give yourself to godly edif edification, it's going to produce charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith. Unfa You're going to have the real, genuine article. So in 2 Timothy 2, when, he, when, he, when he, he's picking up those instructions, verse number 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow, here's the positive, righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Where did you get the pure heart? Well, 1 Timothy 1, 5, you got it out of the godly edification. But foolish and unlearned questions... Avoid. Where did they come from back over there? They came from changing the doctrine, paying attention to stories, and endless genealogies. Anything that goes away from the doctrine generates endless questions, foolish and unlearned questions. I love that, the way it says that. Foolish questions, unlearned questions. Come back to Proverbs chapter 22. There's a, there's a weird set of instructions back here in Proverbs. Uh, not 22, it's 26. And if you've never done any, any, you know, gotten out and done evangelism with people on the street corner, these two verses won't make a lot of sense to you. The folks that were just spent, if you've heard the people talk about the last couple of uh, days about being at the fair and at, at the, the, the Schomburg Fest and up at the Walworth Fair and all the contacts they've had with, with, with people then these two verses kind of make, it, it, it's kind of a, make, make a little more sense to you. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Now he said, now wait a minute. Answer a fool not according, answer not a fool and then it says, answer a fool. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool according to his folly. Obviously, he's talking about two different kind of situations. There's a certain kind of foolish question that is not ignorant and unlearned. It's a genuine searching. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Lest thou also be like unto him, lest you look like him. But answer a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool in a way to expose the folly. Don't be a don't be a jerk with the uh, you know don't don't go be a jerk like the other guy. But with this guy, point out his error, lest he be wise in his own conceits. That way you can you can you can help him out with with, with an answer. The answer is not in what he says; it's in what God says. Well, foolish and unlearned, foolish questions are, are questions like Romans chapter 1. They reject God and they became foolish in their imaginations. 
human viewpoint questions, unlearned questions. The unlearned questions are, that guy, you don't want to answer that guy that way because unlearned questions, uh, when he talks about foolish and unlearned questions, avoid. There are a lot of people who, if you have an, unle if you have an unlearned question, a, a question that's just ignorant, what do you need to do? You, don't you need to learn how to study and get the answer for yourself? You know, a lot of folks will let you do their studying for them. Sometime I'll get mail. I had a letter one time years ago, and a guy sent like 27 questions. It would have taken, you know, five pages to answer each question. And he said, I got a couple of, I got some questions. And he wrote all these questions. And I wrote him back. I said, you know, those are all good questions. I think you ought to spend some time studying them. And here's how you can find the answer. And I wrote him back about how to study. Instead of me just giving him the answer. You're not really helping him by just giving him the answer. Now, when you answer questions for people, it's better to help them understand what the answer is. That's the, that's the thing over in the Proverbs. But foolish and unlearned questions, by the way, you don't have to go out on a street corner to find that. You can go listen to things like Pal Talk and look at YouTube, not YouTube, but uh, Facebook, and you can find hordes and hordes of foolish and unlearned questions. You can find teachers that hadn't got an idea about what they're doing, that for the time they need to go and study, and that kind of knowing that they do gender strife. Come with me to Isaiah 29. The very last verse of Isaiah 20. Here's a verse I just, I'm in love with. Isaiah 29, verse 24. They also that err in spirit shall come to understanding. And they that murmur Shall what? Learn doctrine. You want to you want to you want to take care of people that don't have understanding. You want to take care of people that are murmuring and complaining and causing strife. The only thing that's going to take care of that in a real true sense is them to learn some sound doctrine. And so what you're doing is you're avoiding the things that carry you away from sound doctrine, that only gender strife. And he's, he's telling Timothy what you need to focus on is the godly edifying because that's the answer to all that strife and contention. Now, if you go back to 2 Timothy 2, he says all that because verse 24, 25, and 26 is a key passage of Pauline instruction about how to recover people who've been caught in false doctrine. If someone ever asks you, can a believer be demon-possessed? The answer is no. But can they be captured by doctrines of devils? Yes. What do you do about someone in that situation? Verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. First, He's got to avoid unlearned and foolish questions. Then he doesn't strive, but be patient unto all men, apt to teach, patient, uh, uh, gentle with all men, I'm sorry, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, look at all those, those descriptions of how you're to be, instructing those that oppose themselves. Those are believers. That's the reason I said to you back in verse number uh, 20, that great house that he's talking about here, I don't believe that's the, that, that's the apostate Christendom. That great house is the body of Christ. Because the people that are confused and caught up in, in the era in that great house are opposing themselves. That is, they are believers acting like they're not believers. If God peradventure, now why, why are you to be gentle and apt to teach and patient, instructing them? if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, watch, that they may recover themselves. 
You can't recover them. They have to recover themselves. You are patient, you're gentle, you're instructing, you're teaching them sound doctrine, but they have to make the choice to believe it. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That captivity is the captivity I spent all summer talking to you about in Ephesians 4. And just like the world is caught in the, cap the satanic captivity, believers can be caught. And Satan's will for the life of a believer is to put you on the sidelines, out of the ministry, out of the work, by catching you in a trap of false doctrine that spoils you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Take you away from the godly edifying and have you focus on changing the doctrine, listening to the stories. This happened to me, that happened to me. If someone asks you, how did you, come to, how did you, how did you come to know for sure you have eternal life? How did you get saved? The way you got saved, I don't care what the experiences were, the way you got saved is trusting Jesus Christ alone. And if I ask you, how did you get saved, that's what I want to hear. Now, if I say, how did it come about? What's your story? What were the circumstances that led to that? That's a different question. Most of the time, if you, you, when you talk about that, what do you do? You hear the story. Hopefully, and I, I'm, not, I'm okay with that. Everybody's got a story. And I, you enjoy hearing them. But hopefully... In that story, you'll hear that I came to trust Christ alone because that's how I got saved. I heard a famous celebrity recently who's a preacher now. And they were asking him, so how did you come to be in the ministry? And he talked about how he was on a car wreck and how they were carrying him into the hospital and he's riding on a gurney and he's looking at the lights go by and he heard the voice talking to him and all these things and he, and he, and he never one time mentioned the cross. He mentioned the experience, the things that happened to him, the lights and all that. Kind of, but he, he never one time said, I trusted Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. And I'm going to tell you straight out, he may have and just didn't tell it in that testimony. But from what I heard, I couldn't say that man's a brother in Christ because all the experience isn't it. See, that's the fable part. And it's really not, it's the experience, the story part. These people are caught in a snare that carries them away from the sound doctrine, has them focused on the experience. That's what 1 Timothy 4, we've got passage this morning. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed. You see, that's the problem. How do you depart from the faith? You give heed to seducing spirits. Your mind is going to be bombarded by false doctrine constantly. But you don't have to give heed to it. If you let it in, if you give it validation... If you change the doctrine, give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That word seducing there, the word has a great definition. It says to draw away from the path of rectitude with the promise of physical delight. <laughs> and I heard that years ago and I said, nah, that's a good definition. To draw away from the path of rectitude, right, truth with the promise of physical ecstasy and physical delight. Here's a, here's a spirit, here's a teacher, a seducing, going to deceive you into thinking truth is there in an experience that you delight in. And it winds up teaching a doctrine of devils. See that human experience? Changing the doctrine. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Said this morning, it's a counterfeit. And the live program is to make it look as much like the truth as it can. Having their conscience seared 
with a hot iron. There's a spiritual searing of a conscience in the side of the person that does that and has it done, does, done to them. That's who you're dealing with in 2 Timothy 2. You're going to try to recover them. And you take the truth, you instruct them, you teach them, you're patient, you're gentle. You're not going to strive, you're not going to fight, you're not going to do the things in verse 23, you're not going to gender strife. The foolish and unarmed questions, you're going to ignore them. They're just going to make fight. You're not going to be worried about defending yourself and making sure they know you're right and they're wrong. You're going to be gentle. Gentleness is how you respond to people, what you do to people, how you treat people. You're going to be kind to them. In meekness, gentleness is an active word. Meekness is a passive word. Gentleness is how you treat people. Meekness is, is, is how you respond to the way other people treat you. And instead of fighting back, you're going to be cool about it. You're going to be willing to accept the criticism without retaliating and without self-defense. You're going to pull the heat out of it. You're going to have some light, not heat. Then you're going to be apt to teach because they need to be instructed in the truth because that's the only thing that's going to recover them. Apt to teach patient. <laughs> of, all, of all of them in that passage, that's probably the hardest. Patient. Because it's not going to be a one-time shot. Patient. Preach the word, be instant in the season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, he's short with all patience, long-suffering. It's going to take a while, probably, to get them out of the era. Because they've been caught up in it. They're opposing themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance, watch, to the acknowledging of the truth. We'll talk about that verse, all the details of it next time. But the whole issue is bringing them to the acknowledging of the truth. So that they can recover themselves out of the snare the lie, the captivity to the will of the devil. And only truth is going to do that. Only the godly edifying. Only them coming to see who they really are in Christ and putting on who he is. As opposed to opposing themselves and acting like they're somebody that they're not. Sometimes we sing that song, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And we've objected to that. Because you're not a sinner saved by grace. You're a saint of the Most High God. <laughs> you used to be a sinner. Now you're saved by grace. And now you're holy and beloved and the elect of God. You're somebody different. So don't live like that's not who you are. And when you see problems and difficulties and failures in, the, in your life, if instead of opposing who you are and saying, oh, I'm just lost and I can't help myself and I'm woe and I'm on you look at it for the reality of what it is and you say, that's not who I am. The grace of God teaches me that denying ungodliness and word of lust, I should live soberly, righteously, and godly. One point, we'll quit. Verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive... This is the ministry of the servant of the Lord. And when I read that, Paul said, I'm the servant of Jesus Christ. Freedom, our freedom in Christ, is not freedom to do what we want to do. But it's the power to do what He wants us to do. Here I am, the Lord's free man, and what does Paul say? 
you're the servant of the Lord. If you look over at Romans chapter 6, you'll see how that works. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Notice that question is asked twice in this chapter. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why? Because we're free. We've been, made, we've been crucified with Christ, buried with Him, raised and walked in newness of life with Him. We have a new identity. We're not under the law, we're under grace. God deals with us with a whole different program today. We're, involved, we're in the total victory program that's in Christ. So what should we say then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. What's grace designed to produce in your life? Fruit unto holiness. <laughs> what does grace teach you? It doesn't teach you, oh, you're free from sin, you can go live in it. It teaches you that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, you can live soberly, righteously, and godly. He doesn't set you free from sin so you can go live in it. You were doing that already. Most of you are doing a pretty good job of it. He sets you free so that he can put some power in you so you can live for him. Verse 16, know ye not? I see he's doing the same thing he did back in verse 3. Know ye not that to whom you yield your, ser your, your ser yourselves servants to obey, his servant ye are to whom you obey. Now he's just going to appeal to common sense. You're a slave, a servant, to whoever you obey. Whether of sin under, right, under death, obedience under righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. How did you get to be free from sin? Look back at verse number 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. How did you get dead? You're crucified with Christ. You've got this new identity. Now he's talking about, hey, that new identity that God gave you in Christ is designed for you to live in it, walk in it. Having been then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. See, he set you free in Christ so he could put some power in you, some life in you, where he could do some living in you. And as the servant of the Lord, as the one in whom he lives, we have a ministry to these people who are held captive by the adversary. And there is a recovery program that God has for you and for me to be involved in with regard to people who are caught in that snare, that religious, that, 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 that doctrines of devils that's caught them in their snare and holds them in that captivity. And all that religious captivity, the answer for it is in this passage. It's time to quit. We'll talk about the details of it next time. But the essence of it is to teach people to quit opposing themselves and to live in the identity that God's given them in Christ as a member of the body of Christ. All right. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, for the high calling that you've given us in Christ Jesus and the privilege we have to be servants of the Lord. We just pray that our hearts might be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We thank you for the privilege of that in Christ's name.